Welcome to the Reader the Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Author Sidney Ocker has just released a new book of poems all about love, loss, and living through narcissistic abuse. It's titled When Teardrops Fall and Other Poems. And I get to find out more about it. The author, Sydney, is here with me now. Sydney, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I appreciate you being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me all about the poetry you've written in When Teardrops Fall and Other Poems? Yes. Yeah, so I first started writing poems in 2020. And the ones that I've compiled in this book are mostly just my thoughts and feelings on a relationship that I was in in 2020. It's just a very dear book to me. It's very personal, and I'm hoping to be able to share some of the thoughts and feelings. I know I'm not alone in this, and I know that there are a lot of other people that have felt the same things that I've felt, and I just want them to know that they're not alone. It takes a lot of courage to publish something so personal like this, Sydney. What was that spark, that inspiration that made you say, yeah, I'm going to go for it? So it was probably my mother. She has always encouraged me to pursue the poems and to express myself. And she wanted me to not forget the things that I had been through and some of the things that had happened to me. And so, yeah, it was probably my mother that really encouraged me to compile it all in a book. Hmm. And is this the first time you've been published then, Sydney? Yes, it is. Congratulations. It's so huge to get that first one out there. What was it like that day when you got your first copy in and you finally got to hold this and look at it? Very surreal. I was very happy. And now that you are officially a published author, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of that for you? Probably the hope that I can help other people going through some of the same things that I've gone through. What are the chances we're going to see another book from you in the future? Have you given that thought? I have given that some thought. I haven't started on a second book, but... There is a possibility. Now, I'm sure you learned a lot being published for the first time, Sydney. Do you have any advice now that you could throw out there to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? Don't give up. Great advice. Now, when you sit down to write your poetry, is it something that flows out of you really easily? Or do you find like writer's block and things like that from time to time? Most of the time, it just kind of flows. There was a couple of times when I sat down and was like, I'm going to write a poem that I did get writer's block. But most of the time, it just kind of comes to me, and I'm like, oh, I need to write this down right now. (laughs) How long was the publishing process for you? Was that a drawn-out process, or did you get through that pretty quickly? It was pretty quick. I believe we started in October. Can you think of anything for that next book, if you write another one, that you would definitely do differently the next time around from how you did things the first time? I don't think so. I think it was a pretty great experience. Oh, fantastic. Sydney, would you call yourself an avid reader? And if so, what kinds of stuff do you like to read? I am definitely an avid reader. I just love reading in general, but probably more history books or biographies. I really like learning about people's lives. And a lot of times, authors who are writing for the first time might not think off the bat of what it's actually going to look like up there on the shelf and the cover and everything. So was that a difficult process for you to decide on the cover and how things were going to look? No, actually. My sister had taken a picture of a waterfall in Alaska. As soon as I saw it, I knew that that was what I wanted the cover to be. So you mentioned your mom being a big inspiration to you. Do you have other people in your life that you find are really inspirational or encouraging to you? Probably also my dad. He's actually, so he has not written poetry, but he definitely has rhymed my entire life. Like even as a little kid, I can remember him just saying things that would rhyme, even though it didn't really make sense. (laughs) And so that's probably been where I've gotten my love for rhyming, which turned into poetry. And where else do you find your inspiration? I know a lot of people are inspiring to you in your life and you like to read, but are there other things in your life that tend to spark those ideas for you? Definitely my family. I've written several for my siblings and some for my niece and one for my dad. 
Again, this is titled When Teardrops Fall and Other Poems. It's written by Sidney Ocker, published by Covenant Books, and you can find it everywhere, like on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Sydney, it's been so nice talking with you here tonight and finding out about your poetry and everything. I, I had a good time. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I had a good time, too. I'm looking at the new, engaging book written by the Reverend James R. Fuchs. It's titled Ponderings of My Heart, Mary the Mother of Yeshua, a series of devotions for Advent and Christmas. And I'm going to find out all about this book. The author, James, is with me now. James, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. And James, can you tell me all about Ponderings of My Heart and what readers can expect? Well, it's a book that started in about 15 years ago. On a spur of the moment, the man who was supposed to write a devotional became ill, and I was volunteered by my wife, and I wrote it in a day and a half, and it was well-received. I put it away, and about eight, nine years later, I pulled it out and updated it and put it away, and then again, I updated it and wrote it to Epiphany, and now it's a finished book, and I'm quite excited that I was able to get it finished and get it into print. Have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to being published? No. No. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Oh, you were working on this book for a long time, James. What was it like whenever you got that first physical copy in and you finally got to hold this book in your hands? It was almost unbelievable to actually see it and then to pick it up and read it. And the thing that came across my mind was, did I really write that? <laughs> and not to pat my back, but there were some things in there that I think were rather unique. And was it generally Christians that you had in mind for this, or was it a more specific audience? It was Christians, but really it's open to all people. And hopefully some people who may not be a believer in Christ may read this and be inspired to open their hearts to what Christ really means. As people would find out in reading the book, both my parents were converts from Judaism. And so it's kind of funny when you look at it, it is a man writing about a woman and what was going through her mind when she was told she was going to be pregnant. And it, it seems kind of far-fetched, but that's what it is. And a lot of people who are going through the publishing process for the first time might be surprised at everything that's involved. James, for you, what was the most challenging part of the publishing end? The editing. Mm. Taking a critical look at suggestions, which, by the way, were excellent, and, and getting it to flow so that it made sense. And now that you are a published author officially, James, what's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? When people read the book and tell me how much it meant to them, a number of people started reading it and they said they didn't read it day by day. They had to read the whole thing through, and then they went day by day. They just didn't want to put it down. And we have a lot of authors listening who are just starting out. Maybe they haven't published yet. James, do you have any advice that you could offer them? Open your mind and don't be discouraged. There's always a few little valleys and a few little bumps along the road, but keep with it and you'll get to the end. Now looking down the road, have you thought about maybe doing a follow-up to this of some sort or another kind of publishing in the future? Yes, I have. And in fact, I'm beginning the outline now. I have a few parts of it done, and I will be working on it in the next year as well. I'm looking at the cover of your book right now, James, and it's beautiful. Can you tell me the kind of process, the kind of thought that went into that? Well, I love streams. And when I need a place to go, I have this place that is very dear to me. And so I put Mary in that spot along the stream with some rocks where you have some noise, like there's a whisper of communication. And since I'm a fly fisherman, it seemed to be a realistic place. And I described the cover like I envisioned it, and they picked up on it immediately, and we only had to make one correction, and the cover was done. They had a lot of trees, and I said, this is a desert. You might have a few brushes, uh, bushes, excuse me, and that's it, and they just did a marvelous job. I think a lot of readers are going to be blessed by this book. Again, it's titled Ponderings of My Heart, Mary, the Mother of Yeshua, a series of devotions for Advent and Christmas. This is written by the Reverend James R. Fuchs, 
It's published by Christian Faith Publishing, so grab it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or also down the street at your local bookshop. James, thanks again for joining me on the show and telling me all about this book. I hope we get to do it again sometime. Thank you and God bless. Seeking My Legacy. It's the new book written by Dr. Stephanie West, and it deals with life's purpose and the indelible impact that one leaves behind. And we're going to talk all about this. Stephanie is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Stephanie, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. I'm excited to learn about Seeking My Legacy. Can you tell me what readers will find? Well, Seeking My Legacy is a deep personal exploration of the purpose of a meaningful legacy. You know, like what am I leaving to my grandkids, my children, my posterity in the future? It's a lot about the different challenges that have come up against me, things that I have been able to accomplish in my life, my dreams, balancing my career and my family, and how my Christian faith has strengthened me through my life along with just leaving tidbits and tips to those that I love and my family and and friends and that kind of thing. Stephanie, what sorts of readers were you writing to here? My primary audience that I envision for this book are Christian men and women who are contemplating the legacy they are leaving behind, whether they're facing challenges of balancing career and family or navigating relationships or seeking to align their lives more closely with their faith. God, Christ. This book offers a lot of insights and inspiration to guide them on their journey. It's for those who want to live with purpose and intentionality and who understand the importance of leaving a meaningful legacy or a name or a purpose that reflects their own values and beliefs behind. Stephanie, what sparked the idea, the motivation to write this book? Well, it started in 2020. In 2020, I lost my dad to heart failure. And then I lost a brother-in-law to COVID-19. And as I was contemplating different things and going to their funerals and watching my family, you know, and my brothers and sisters, I come from a family of nine children, and listening to them talk about my dad, you know, and the way they talked about dad and the way he loved my mom so dearly, that I started to think, what am I leaving behind? And then three months later, lost his brother-in-law to COVID-19. And again, he had 10 children, him and his wife, and they were high school sweethearts, you know, and he just watched these generations of children come through and talking about their dads, you know. And so I started to really think about this because my whole life has been in education. I've been an educator for 28 years. And so I started to think, what am I leaving behind? And so that's when I just really started to reflect on my life's challenges, how I've gotten through them. It's a very full bearing book. You know, I put a lot out there to help readers and to just to compile everything. So my kids had something when I leave, Hmm. you know, that they can read about my life. Was this a long journey getting it written and published? It took about two years. It really took about two years. Initially, I self-published it uh, about eight months ago, and then Covenant Books picked it up. So it's about a two-year journey as I went through. Just started at the basics, you know, started as a child being raised on a farm in a family of nine, and then moving through and meeting my husband and the love of my life. We've been married 37 years, and the challenges we had having children, the challenges I had in education you know, in my career with students with some real hard challenges, anxieties, depressions over my life. I was stopped at one point. So I dive into that and how I overcame all of that. And so I wanted it to be more of an inspiration for those and for women out there that may have these same trials but are thinking that they just can't get through it. And that's why I wrote it to help others too. And it must have been a great day when your first copy came in and you got to hold Seeking My Legacy for the first time and see your name on the cover and everything. Stephanie, what was that like for you? Oh, that was pretty incredible. You know, I'm in my 50s. This has always been on my bucket list to have a book published by a a reputable publishing house. And so when this came out in its form, it was really, really exciting. An accomplishment that I always dreamed about, but never thought would happen. (laughs) (laughs) It was awesome. It was so exciting to pull out that book and to see it the first time. Hmm. 
I think a lot of readers are going to find a lot in this book, be really into it, and I encourage those listening to seek it out. Again, the title is Seeking My Legacy. It's written by Dr. Stephanie West, published by Covenant Books, so of course you can get it anywhere, like on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, and also down the street, your local bookshop. Well, Stephanie, it's been really nice talking with you here and learning all about Seeking My Legacy. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. The new audiobook we're going to talk about is an imaginative tale of adventure and wonder. It's titled Sophie, the Magnificent, and the Moon City. This is written by Eduardo Salazar Castillo, and we're going to talk about it right now. Eduardo is here with me at the show. Eduardo, welcome. I appreciate you being with me tonight. Not a problem. I'm really excited to be doing this. I'm excited to be finding out all about this audiobook. Can you tell me all about Sophie, the Magnificent, and the Moon City? What do readers find here? Well, when I created the idea, I just thought that while there's a lot of books out there about magic and young child heroes, there was just nothing to me that just spoke to children about magic being fun. So when I wrote my book, I based it off my niece, who's named Sophie, and I did all the things that I thought kids could do. Like if kids were in the dark, they would want light, but not just, you know, they don't think bulb of light. They think things should glow. And that's something from the book, but If all the things that kids could do, they could do magic. If they thought they could ice skate across water, they could do it. If they thought they could build a boat out of rocks, it would sail right across the sea. And it's just about kids using their imagination to make magic happen rather than using spells or wands or, you know, any kind of amulets. You know, just using their imagination and their belief alone makes magic possible in this world. Oh, I love it. This is a children's book. Eduardo, what ages of children do you think this is best for? Younger children, older children? I wrote it so my niece could read it because she was 11 at the time and she read it. And some of my other uncles who were dying to read it some moment I came out with it before it got published. They actually quite enjoyed it. And it's written in such a way that anybody could read it and most people can enjoy it. The youngest person that read it was a friend of mine's daughter. She was seven years old when she read it and she really enjoyed it and can't wait for book number two to come out. So when it comes to writing books and being published and everything, Eduardo, have you done this kind of thing before or are you new to this? I tried several different books before. Nothing really happened for me. It wasn't until the pandemic happened that I was able to, you know, buckle down and decided to myself I was going to start from scratch and I needed a whole new idea. And it just so happens that at the time I would tell my nephew stories I would make up on the spot to put him to sleep. And my mother overheard me. You know, she's like, did you make that up? I go, yeah, I just made it up on the spot. She's like, you need to write that down. (laughs) And uh, yeah, no, it took me a little while to write it out. But yeah, I basically wrote it so anybody could read it. But also they could enjoy it, you know? So from the time you sat down and began it, clear up until the time when it was put through the publishing and finally got out there in stores, what sort of a time period was that? It took me just as long to write it as it did for it to hit the story. It took about nine months to write it. It did take me a little bit longer to find someone to publish it, but it took me about four or five months to get someone to publish it. So it took roughly, say, two years from start till it actually hit the shelves. For the printed edition, when you finally got that first physical copy in and it's a real thing now, you got to hold it in your hands, what was that moment like? I'm not going to lie. I was so shocked when I finally got it. Like, I wish I could say that I, you know, like I was crying. I was so happy. I was in shock. (laughs) I was in shock. My friend was there with me. He's like, he's like, you're not saying anything. He's like, you're barely blinking. I was just like, dude, I go, I am shocked. I wrote a bunch of books that just never seemed to be good enough to get published. Finally, it happened. And it was like the most amazing thing in the world. I still have my first copy. It's on a little mantle on my bookshelf. Oh, I love it. And when you look at the cover, I mean, it's great. It's beautiful. Can you tell me about the process, a thought that went into that? I had told them that what I wanted was a, I wanted the moon city, which is just a city made of silvery white light. But I wanted my niece in there in, in the picture with the rainbow wall that's part of the city as well. And I just wanted that. But I wanted the queen from the first book is a griffin and I wanted it in the sky. And I just wanted two eyes for the bad guy in the forest. And this was one of the things that they came up with. And I thought it, this is the most amazing because if you actually take a picture of my niece from when she was a kid wearing a similar dress, it looks just like her. Oh, wow. So I was just like, I was caught off guard. I was like, well, you know what? This is the one that I want. It was perfect, yes. Again, it's titled Sophie the Magnificent and the Moon City. This is written by Eduardo Salazar Castillo, 
and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so get it on Audible or iTunes or at Amazon, every place that you normally pick up your audiobooks. Eduardo, thank you again for joining me and telling me all about this. I had a really nice time talking with you. I really appreciate it. This is actually one of the funnest things I've had to do with my book in a long time, and I really appreciate the experience. Sunshine Makes a Difference, Wonder of the Stars. It's the new book out by Ellen Coleman, where readers will find lessons in empathy and kindness. We're going to talk more about this book. I'm talking with Ellen right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Ellen, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's very exciting. I appreciate you being here, Ellen. Can you tell me all about what readers are going to find when they open up Sunshine Makes a Difference? Well, besides really cute hedgehogs and sweet elderly owl, they will find a sweet story that focuses on kindness and forgiveness and ministering to others and how to share the love of Jesus. So the hedgehog and the owl, how did all this come about? Well, actually, when I first got the idea for a character, I named him Sunshine. And then I got to thinking, well, what woodland animal hasn't been you know, used and used and used, and what would be really cute and what do I like? Well, I like hedgehogs. Sunshine is a hedgehog, and then I've always adored owls and collected them as a young child. And so then I picked an owl for the character in this book, and he's Mr. Hoot. Get it? I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Ellen, what kinds of readers were you writing for here? This is for Christian families with young children and grandparents to read aloud to their like three to seven year olds. I read my books to all different ages and they all seem to like it. Maybe it's just because they're being nice to me, but (laughs) predominantly it's preschool through like seven year olds. And the illustrations are really beautiful. How did those all come together? Well, actually, the publisher company did the illustrations. I sent them detailed descriptions and explanations of what I wanted, and then they sent me sample mock-ups. And then I said, oh, okay, well, tweak this, tweak that. I really didn't have to do very much. It was actually quite incredible to me. Like, they really understood what I wanted, and it, it was perfect. I was just more than thrilled. Wonderful. Ellen, is this your first time doing anything like this, or did you have a background in things like this? This is actually my second book. Seeds of Sunshine is the first one featuring Sunshine the Hedgehog. That's the story of him and his Grammy and how Grammy helps him to forgive some kids at school who were saying mean words to him. And she used analogy from a cocoon that, you know, bursts into a butterfly describing, you know, what Jesus has done for us. And then the dandelion puffs, when you blow on them, they're seeds go everywhere. And so I use the analogy like our words are like the seeds. Wherever they fall, are they going to plant seeds of encouragement and joy? Or are they going to plant discouragement and angry thoughts or mean thoughts? And Sunshine decides that he wants to be kind and forgiving. So that was the first one. And then this is the second one where Sunshine ministers to the elderly owl, Mr. Hoot. And Grammy helps him with that. Before that, I actually wrote for a newspaper for nine years, so I do have some writing background. Being you have more of a journalistic writing background, was that a big jump for you to jump from that style of writing into writing children's books? Not really. I really enjoy creative writing, and I also write poetry. And so the first book really jumped off from a poem I had written, which included the dandelion puffs. But this is really a fulfillment of a lifelong dream, being able to write and publish a children's book. I have grandkids now, and so it's just really special for me to be able to do this. How long of a journey was this for you once you sat down and started working on Sunshine Makes a Difference, clear up until it was published? Was that a long one? No. I really wrote the story in a few hours, but took a couple of months to polish it, tweak it, make sure it was perfect. And then I sent it into the publisher in August, and then it was out, like, January. So it really didn't take very long. I love the theme of positivity that (laughs) seems to be all throughout your writing and everything. That's really fantastic. We need more of that. I think so, too. My vision is to provide sweet stories that tell the love of Jesus for Christian families. Again, this is titled, Sunshine Makes a Difference. Wonder of the Stars. It's written by Ellen Coleman, 
published by Christian Faith Publishing, so get it anywhere that you usually pick up your books, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Ellen, it's been so nice talking with you here tonight and learning about your wonderful work. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate you calling me and giving me this opportunity. The new book by Timothy Leacock. It's titled Refugee on the Threshold, A True Story. This follows a Somali refugee's desperate pleas to escape certain death and seek asylum. And we're going to talk all about this book here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Tim, is with me. Tim, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here tonight. It's good to be with you, Corey. Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate your time, Tim. Can you tell me all about what you've written about in Refugee on the Threshold? Yes, it's about a refugee from Somalia. He has to leave his country because of a death threat. It's about his dangerous journey, but it's also more than that. It's about obstacles he encountered once he got to America and how much he had to sacrifice his time and all of that to get asylum. It's about other people, too, the people that befriended him, shared his struggle. So it's really their story, too. You said this is creative nonfiction. It is based on a true story. So how were you inspired to write this? Where did the idea come from? Well, the first thing that popped into my head, I think, was this is a story that needs to be written. And I met this person, the subject of the book, and just started talking with him. And he really, you know, I brought up the idea of would it be okay if I wrote a story, his story, his true story. And he said, sure, he'd love me to do that. So I got his permission, basically. And then I interviewed him and others as I went along. And I just was enjoying writing. So this was like almost two years ago now when I started. Did you have a target readership in mind? Who do you think might be really into this? Well, I'd say my main reader target is people interested in social justice, particularly immigration issues, hence the title of my book, Refugee. But I think everyone can get something from this remarkable story. Really, I hope people will identify with the other characters, maybe the major character, but the other characters and how they can make a difference in the life of someone. And on the threshold in that title, I'm leaving that open because they'll find out about what that means in the book. Now, Tim, prior to Refugee on the Threshold, have you been published? No. Uh, no, I started out with taking a couple of creative writing classes. I have a master's degree and wrote a lot of papers, but I never did anything quite like this. There's nothing like seeing that finished product, so... Tim, what was it like when the day came, you got your physical copy in for the first time, and you got to look at it, hold it, your name's on the cover? What was that like for you? <laughs> I'd say it was really a joyful time. I think what I really was celebrating was the accomplishment. Mm. My former career was as an electrical engineer, and I just loved to build things, complete a project, something I worked on all aspects of, and something that I could just say, this is something I did. I'm a lifelong learner, and I love to learn new things. So this is a new thing for me. When it comes to the publishing end of things, there's certainly a lot involved there. Tim, what did you find the most challenging part of it for you? Well, I had Covenant Books to help me along the way, and there's a lot of things in the publishing area that I didn't really want to do all by myself. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write. What was the most challenging? I think putting myself out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. So based on everything you went through, and I'm sure you learned a few things now along the way, Tim, what advice now would you have for the new authors out there? Well, I would say the first thing, if you're going to write, write about something you really care about and something that you want to share with other people. And then the other thing, which I've, you know, in my research, most authors stumble on is, you know, continuing to write. And I'm, I would just encourage people to do that. The first time, the first draft is not that great but it gets better as you get help with revising and all of that. I had seven people help me revise. I call them my beta readers. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, and then once that was completed and I had made most of the changes to the book based on their input, I talked to my wife and we decided, well, let's go and get a professional editor. So that's what we did. And that extended the time, but I really wanted to make this the best I could. So that was well worth it. Again, it's titled Refugee on the Threshold, A True Story. It's written by Timothy Leacock. 
and published by Covenant Books, so you can get it everywhere, like on Amazon, and Barnes & Noble, and iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Tim, it's been really wonderful speaking with you here tonight and learning all about refugee and everything that went into it. Thanks again for joining me. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. The Grumpy Gammy. It's the new book by author Jay Matthews, and it deals with wonderful themes like respect and compassion. We're talking all about it right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Jay, is here with me. Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, Jay. I appreciate you being here with me. Well, thank you. I am so happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy to have you and really happy to be learning about the Grumpy Gammy. Can you tell me about it? Well, The Grumpy Gammy is actually a book about two children who visit their grandmother, and they're not really in sync with her rules. They don't really say anything to their mother at first, and then finally, one day when they do go to their grandmother's house, the mom catches Wyatt calling her a name. He calls her Grumpy, and so the mom asks why. And he kind of shies away from it at first, and then he just lets it roll. He just tells her everything that, you know, he just does not like about Gammy's house. So mom actually sits down with them, and she puts them in a place where they have to kind of put themselves in the grandmother's position. And when it comes to their own things, to get them to understand why she has her rules. This, in a sense, does bring them to a point of saying, oh, okay, you know, it doesn't say it in the book, but you can tell they're like, okay, we never thought about it that way. And which is what I want to invoke with people who read the book and children who hear the book is to try and get them to put themselves in others' positions so they can see maybe why people are acting a certain way or they have certain rules or, you know, if you don't understand their actions, maybe if you put yourself in their place, you would understand it more. What inspired this story? Where'd you get the idea? Actually, from real life events, my two grandchildren, Wyatt and Maddie, stayed with me for quite a while during the day while their parents worked. And Wyatt was just really insistent. He's a little redhead ball of fire. <laughs> and he was insistent on knowing why this and why that. And, you know, we don't do this at my house. And, you know, he was just really kind of punching it in there, <laughs> stating his case. And when it comes to writing, being published and everything, is this your first book or have you done this kind of thing before? No, this is my very first book. Very first one. Congratulations. That's such a big deal to get that first one out. How long did this take you? Was it a long time? It took me about six months to really get everything formulated, get the title down, get exactly what I wanted to share. Again, the book actually encourages me to put myself in the place of my grandchildren. So, therefore, I was able to go back and forth between the two characters, mom and the children, as to what I would like to see come out of this book. A lot of people publishing for the first time might be a little surprised about what the publishing process is actually like and how much is involved there. What did you find the most challenging part of that for you? I guess probably not the editing, because this is quite a simple book, but the most challenging was actually getting down what the characters were doing on each page, you know, how they were standing, you know, what kind of expressions did they have, because going back and forth with the publisher to make sure that we were conveying what the words were saying on the page. I can only imagine what you're feeling, what you were thinking whenever you finally got your first physical copy in and you got to hold the grumpy gammy for the first time. What was that like? Uh, it was unbelievable. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It's amazing to see something that you've worked hard on, but actually, you know, that you have a lot of emotion into it as well. So to hold it in my hand, I actually cried because I thought, okay, here it is. And I can't believe it. And I'm, like I said, I'm still trying to, you know, put it in my head that, you know, you're, <laughs> people say, oh man, you're an author. And I'm like, you know, why don't I feel like, you know, 100%? an author because it's unreal because it's so big. I'm just so happy. And every time I look at the book, I just kind of get this little gleam of happiness, you know, surging through me like, you really did it. <laughs> Again, this is called The Grumpy Gammy. It's written by Jay Matthews and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can get it everywhere that you normally go to pick up books like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes and also down the street at your local bookshop. 
Well, Jay, it's been really nice talking with you here. I hope we can do this again sometime. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. And thank you so much. I do appreciate it. We are going to talk about a book right now that's a powerful story of family connection and self-discovery. It's titled Raging Mice. It's written by Thomas Lucas. And Tom is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we're going to talk all about it. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Oh, appreciate being invited. Thanks, Corey. Absolutely. Tom, can you tell me all about Raging Mice and what you've written about here? I was drafted when I was 18 and sent to Vietnam, and I had a number of adventures and misadventures during my tour. So I had become a writer when I was in my teens. I think I was just set up to be a writer. My mother was feeding me weird books for an 8, 9, 10-year-old. I remember the first one she gave me was Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Valley. Then she would feed me, like, Faulkner, so that by the time I was in my teens, I was, had begun to write poetry and songs. But I began writing seriously in the year or so before I went to Vietnam. While I was in Vietnam, I finished this kind of autobiographical romantic tragedy. And uh, I actually ended up losing that manuscript in a cab in New York City. I spent a year kind of holed up in the country, and I wrote this 550-page episodic autobiographical kind of account of what I had experienced in Vietnam. Well, I sent it to an important agent. When I went to her office, she began telling me what a terrible book I had tried to write and all the things that were wrong with it. Of course, really crestfallen, but I realized she was, she was right. Two years later, I suddenly got this inspiration and vision of this new Vietnam novel that would encapsulate what I had learned about how Vietnam experience affected people psychologically. It was drawn from experience and so forth, and, and that turned out to be Raging Mice. So Raging Mice focuses on four characters who are really lower-ranking enlisted men. It's not about the war per se. It's about how that environment then, that all male kind of military environment took a young kid like me, 18, and others like me, and suddenly we're in this artificial environment that's surreal and different than anything we knew about from home. So I trace how psychologically these different kind of powerless, lower-ranking guys, how they evolve or devolve throughout their tour. It's pretty exciting. It's cinematic. It's not a long, turgid read. This is a focused, intense, 150-page short novel that can be read in, like, two afternoons, really. Oh, Tom, when you were writing this, did you have a specific readership in mind? Who were you writing for? I don't really think about an audience that I'm writing for. I trust that my roots and my experience are going to, if something's inspired that comes out of me as a song, a poem, or a novel, it's going to have relevance. That's the nature of, I think, the true artistic process. One has to trust that. This book, I really see it as significant for young men and women who are maybe at late high school, early college, contemplating their futures and what they might do and the decisions they might make in that regard. And it's also a great book for veterans, people who have served in the military or who are now. There's a big audience there. I think certainly adults who enjoy fiction that's written from inspiration and seriously. Do you have any advice now that you could give to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? It's the old truth that are going to make it or break it for you. Know thyself. It begins with that. You have to understand yourself. You have to understand what's the motivation for you writing. Is it inspiration or do you just want to be a pop star or a celebrity? Mm. You really need to be honest with yourself and, and figure that out. Once you do, and if you're writing for the right purposes to serve the source of true inspiration, then there'll be lots of ups and downs. The industry will chew you up. But, you know, once you've written something that you know in your heart is really worthwhile, you take that to the bank of spirituality. But I'm afraid don't expect that the industry is going to come running. That's for sure. Well, this sounds like a book that I think a lot of readers are going to be into. Again, it's titled Raging Mice, written by Thomas Lucas and published by Newman Springs Publishing. So go anywhere that you usually pick up your books, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes and traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to find this. Well, Tom, it's been really great having you on the show and finding out all about this book. I appreciate your time. 
Corey, I appreciate yours, and best wishes down the road. We're going to talk about a book right now that's a powerful story of family connection and self-discovery. This is a book written by Pamela Chatterton Purdy, and it's titled Birds in My Closet. Pamela's here with me now at the Reader House Off the Roundtable, and I get to find out more about this. Pamela, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here, too. Can you tell me all about Birds in My Closet? What will readers find here? Birds in My Closet was inspired by an experience that the author's husband had with their adopted son of Black Vietnamese heritage. Hoang, age five, had squirreled himself away in his closet, feeling less vulnerable having slept on a mat in Vietnam. His mom and dad supply him with a sleeping bag in hopes that he will have fewer nightmares. He talks to his dad and expresses his struggle with being different from the other kids at school, where he is called Blackie and Cotton Picker. He has taped pictures of birds all over his walls from his Ranger Rick magazines. His dad crawls in beside him and asks, what if all these birds looked alike? Hoang recognizes that it would be a pretty dull world. The boy falls asleep and dreams that he wakes up in a nest as a blooming full-feathered bird. Every bird in Birdship County looks just like him. And so the adventure of finally discovering the value of his uniqueness begins. Pamela, what gave you the idea to write this and publish this? Well, believe it or not, I wrote it when I was 40 years old, and that was 43 years ago. Oh, wow. (laughs) I was cleaning out a closet during COVID, and I found the book unfinished, and I thought, you know, I'm going to finish it. The book is interesting because there's a wizard that has already granted two wishes to Birdship County, and there's one wish left. And so Hoang, who said, I think that the wizard really loves fish. If we catch a fish, we can take it to him and ask if he will grant the third wish that we all become what we want to be in terms of color. And I'll read the back short part at the back of the book. The third wish was granted and the birds of Featherton County, Birdship County, and all counties became exactly as they had hoped. Each one became the color, size, and shape with stripes or without that they would wish to be. Hoang became a beautiful hoot owl, for he had become very wise, and the world was never so beautiful, thanks to his friend, the kingfisher. When Hoang awoke the next morning, snug in his closet, there were all his friends. Their pictures were all over his walls. The closet door was wide open. A deep, warm feeling crept over and around him. And that's the end of the book. Pamela, did you have a certain reading audience in mind that you were writing for here? Well, I would say elementary school. Hmm. I'm already selling the book on Amazon, and we had an occasion today at the Unitarian Church in Brewster, and we sold quite a few copies right there. That's fantastic. Yeah, diversity is a big issue today, and I think from an early age, children need to embrace who they are, no matter what they are, no matter what race, no matter what color, and this book hopefully helps to bring that to a conclusion. I love it. Prior to Birds in My Closet, Pamela, have you been published? Yes. If anybody would like to go to my website, www.chatterton-purdyart.com, they will see many books that my husband and I have published. Having two adopted sons of color, we got heavily involved in the civil rights movement. And in Hyannis, we're part of the Zion Union Heritage Museum, which is a museum that celebrates people of diversity, African-Americans. And if you go to my website, then you will see The latest book is Slavery to Civil Rights to Black Lives Matter. And there are icons that I created that are painted red first. They're on wood, but they're painted red first, then gold leaf. And the red is there to show that the Holy Spirit was behind the civil rights movement. Nonviolence was so important Mm. during the civil rights movement. And that was basically the success. Even though many people died during the civil rights movement, their deaths were not at a loss. We've come so far. Well, this book certainly has a wonderful message, and I think a lot of people are going to be into it, and I I encourage everybody listening, definitely go check it out. Again, it's titled Birds in My Closet. It's written by Pamela Chatterton Purdy and published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can get it everywhere, like on her website or Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. I understand Walmart even has it. Somebody emailed me, oh my God, I just got one at Walmart. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a huge deal. That's great. Yes, we're very excited. I love it. Well, Pamela, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about this book and about everything, all those wonderful messages you're putting out there. I had a nice time talking with you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for calling.
Right now, we're going to talk about a new book that's a collection of poems tackling complicated, abstract, and philosophical themes of human identity. It's titled The Dakini Codex, and it's written by Nicole Personette. And Nicole is right here with me now, and we're going to talk all about this. Nicole, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here tonight. It's a pleasure to have you, Nicole. And I'm excited to find out about the Dakini Codex. Could you tell me what readers can find here? Yes, it's actually a compilation of a lot of different subjects, including things that touch on anthropology, archaeology, esoteric history, hidden histories, and metaphysical subjects. So it combines a lot of different subjects into one continuous theme. Yeah, it is really diverse. Where did all that come from? What inspired you to write this? Well, it really came from writings that were inspired by my higher self and through subjects that I was really intrigued by, things that touch on quantum science and physics. I wanted to be able to explain a wide variety of subjects. And I knew that I could touch on those subjects if I could get a little bit of everything involved, because it's kind of like it all falls into peace with each other, much like the ancients knew, like the jewel in the lotus. They're all faceted pieces, but they make a beautiful part of the whole in explaining the nature of reality. So I came to those inspirations upon my writing and compiled my book. Hmm. Do you have a certain group of readers that you think would be really into this? I think that a lot of readers that have those variety of subjects that would be interested in, including physics and science, esoteric history, anthropology, archaeology, that are interested in lyrical sonnets, in philosophical ideas, and the nature of reality would be ideal for these kind of poems. And Nicole, is this your first published work, or have you been published prior to this? I have been published prior to it. I had received the Diamond Homer Award for my poem, The Beauty Above Its Day. I was honored with that piece in Anaheim, California and received a, another award for a poem that I wrote called To Be Young that was in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've written for the Women's Initiative and published three different times by their Challenge to Change essay contest. They had granted me a gift certificate to a writer's club here locally in Charlottesville. And I've attended literary performances both at the French Press and the Bridge Performing Arts Center in Charlottesville and in Harrisonburg. So once you started writing the poetry for this book, clear up until it was published and hit stores, how long of a time period was that? Was it a long time for you? started writing when I was in high school and published in their literary magazine and continued my work in another venues in literary magazines and books across the United States. So my idea was to compile my work in one place where it could all be found. And so that being the case, I started on the endeavor working to publish my book, and Covenant Books had taken me up on the offer. What are the chances, Nicole, that we're going to see another book from you here in the future? Well, I have began to write more poetry, so oh, wonderful. I am guessing that there will be another book when that comes and is available. Well, myself, I'm really intrigued by the poetry in this book, and I think readers are really going to be intrigued as well. Again, the title of this is The Dakini Codex. It's written by Nicole Personet, published by Covenant Books. So you can pick it up everywhere you normally go to pick up your books, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Nicole, thank you so much for joining me here tonight and telling me all about this work. I had a really nice time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure and honor to be here. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. 
We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. Or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.